Open your Bibles today to Acts chapter 19 as we keep progressing through. And I love being able to preach through the book of Acts and have missionaries come because what we see Paul doing in Acts is what missionaries do today. They go and they minister, they plant churches, they visit churches that they've planted, they come back and report, we pray for them, we support them. That's the pattern that was set for us in Acts, and we try to repeat that in our world today. We're going to see a little bit more of that here in Acts chapter 19. But before we dig into the text, let me sort of paint a picture for you this morning. Imagine with me that you're walking through a yard, a nice large yard with grass and lots of old mature trees. And as you walk through this yard, an old dead brown leaf from one of the trees falls off of the branch and lands on the ground and your foot crunches it as you walk along in the grass. Now, as I paint that scene for you, if I were to ask, what season is it in your mind? Most likely, you would say, it's fall. But actually, the scene I'm painting for you right now in your minds is actually springtime. And it's a leaf and several leaves on these branches of trees. Before the leaves come out, the new leaves come out, these leaves, these old brown leaves that are dead have lasted through the winter. They lasted through the cold. They lasted through all of the legendary Iowa wind. That happens sometimes. You see trees that made it through the winter. They made it to spring with leaves that are still on the branches Dead leaves on branches. But finally, something will make them fall. Those leaves will not stay on forever. And as you walk through that yard and you feel those leaves fall, what is it that made those leaves fall? As much as they can hold on through the winter and through the winds, they cannot hang on. When the new life of that tree begins to course through the branches and push those buds, when life comes through that tree those leaves can't hang on anymore. And they fall off in the wake of new life coming through those branches. In a spiritual sense, friends, I want you to understand that the new life that Christ gives us in the gospel, that when we come to believe the truth of the gospel, that Jesus took the payment for our sin, that He gives us His righteousness, and as we grow in the gospel, That life of Jesus through the gospel courses through like fresh sap in a tree, courses through our bodies and our minds and our hearts and pushes the old leaves of the sinful nature off of our branches. And how often are some of those leaves still hanging around, those stubborn leaves of sinfulness? But friends, those leaves can't stay on those branches when we are taking in gospel truth and when we are growing in the new life of the gospel. We're going to watch that take place today in the city of Ephesus as Paul ministered in Ephesus for nearly three years. As the gospel took root in people's hearts, it began to push off the dead leaves of superstitions and false doctrine that these believers held on to. And it also is going to push through the culture and create a conflict of culture in this text today. This is what we like to refer to as Paul's third missionary journey. And here in Ephesus, we're going to watch the darkness roar back at Paul as he says in another place in the Scriptures that he fought wild beasts in Ephesus. We're going to see what that means here today in Acts chapter 19. I want you to just take a look a look at the map briefly of Paul's third missionary journey. It really wasn't a journey of sorts as it was he went to Ephesus and home-based in Ephesus. He did a little bit of traveling from Ephesus, but he was really in Ephesus for those three years, preaching and teaching God's Word. And as he preached and as people came to know Jesus as Savior, the new life of Jesus Christ began to conquer the darkness in Ephesus. And so I want you to see this morning two phases of this chapter. We're going to watch the story roll out in two phases. And the first phase of this chapter is this, when new life is conquering the darkness. And the first half of chapter 19 is all about the new life of the gospel that conquers the darkness in Ephesus. Paul settles down, teaches and preaches for nearly three years, and I want you to see in verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them 
about the kingdom of God. Paul started as he always did in the synagogue, and what we're going to see first here in the city of Ephesus is tents and teaching. Paul goes into Ephesus, and he takes up a job of making tents. And for his entire time in Ephesus, he was bivocational. He was working a job. He was making tents and canvases and supporting himself, as he says later, with his own hands. And the reason he supported himself with his own hands is because religion was big business in Ephesus. And so Paul wanted to make sure that nobody could accuse him of trying to make money off of the gospel. And so he worked. And he preached and he started in the synagogue for three months. Now, this is a record for the Apostle Paul to go three months with no riot. Because usually he gets there and he preaches a couple days and there's a riot. But after three months, there was resistance. And look what it says in verse 9. But when some became hardened, they would not believe they slandered the way. And so there is some resistance. And so Paul moves on to a new location. And it says at the end of verse 9 that he goes to this lecture hall of Tyrannus. In this lecture hall was a for-rent venue. Many people and historians believe that in that day, the lecture hall of Tyrannus was probably available from about 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. You see, the work day for people in those days, you would get up and you'd start work at 7 and work till 11, and then go back to work at 4 p.m. and work till 9 p.m. And so what did you do in the middle of the day? It was called a siesta. How many of you would like that work schedule? Let me see your hands. Go on early, nap all afternoon, and come back to work in the evening. Well, that was what it was like in Ephesus. And in the middle of the day, he rented this lecture hall. And Paul was hard at work for these three years. He would work in the morning from 7 to 11. He would lecture in the afternoon and teach the Scriptures. Then he'd go back to work at 4 and work till 9 o'clock at night. A lot of hard work for a number of years of preaching the gospel. And we see that it was a fruitful time of ministry for him. Look with me at verse 10 in your Bibles. I have this circled because it's just a very important verse. It said, this went on for two years so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Let me just show you this map here. This is a map of the seven churches of Asia. The seven churches we read about in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Many people believe that while Paul was here during his third missionary journey, he planted in Ephesus and then made several trips and planted all of these other churches while he was in Ephesus on this third missionary journey. All that to say, his time in Ephesus was very fruitful. Paul got a lot done as a bivocational minister working in the morning, working in the evening, and preaching in the afternoon and planted all of these churches and God worked mightily through the hands of the Apostle Paul. Well, at the same time, there were others that were trying to counterfeit the gospel as well. So secondly, we see miracles and magicians. Look what it says with me in verse 11. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even the face cloths or the aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, God used these miracles in a special way. The city of Ephesus was very superstitious. They loved magic. They loved spiritism. And so God actually used this as a bridge to reach people. But it wasn't the centerpiece of evangelism. And what are aprons and face cloths? Well, these are handkerchiefs, basically, that Paul used as he worked. He would wipe the sweat with the handkerchiefs and discard it. The aprons covered his clothing. And people were coming to his home, taking his discarded, sweaty hankies home and it was healing people where they would put the hanky on someone that had a malady it was healing them so in my back pocket i've got two used kleenexes ten dollars for the first person to come up here come on anybody want these guaranteed to heal you right away it's not going to happen right but it's interesting there's people that do this and here in the same culture that paul ministered in verse 13 there were some charlatans that decided to grab a hold of this power. It says, now some of them, the itinerant Jewish exorcists, also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Every once in a while, I'll get a piece of mail that that I really enjoy getting, and maybe you've gotten these before. It's like a brochure from an evangelist. Have you ever seen one of these before? You open up the brochure from this evangelist, and it shows him next to a waterfall praying over a whole pile of letters, right? 
And then he's another picture. He's holding a baby. He's shaking the hand of a poor person. At the end of the brochure, you learn that you can get your very own hanky that he's dipped in the Jordan River. And if you take that hanky, you can prayerfully place it over somebody who needs healing, and they will be healed, and it's yours for the low price of $19.99. All you have to do is call 1-800-525-6784 or send to P.O. Box 578. Have you ever received one of those before? I love I keep those. Those are treasures to me because they're so ridiculous, right? This was not what Paul was doing. He wasn't selling his sweat rags. God was using this to save people in Ephesus and there were people like the modern evangelists of our day who send out brochures and try to charge for stuff like this. There were people like that in Paul's day as well, and they began to try to fake the power of God. Verse 14, there were some other ones named the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest. We know nothing about this person, where he came from or who he was, but they were also trying to do this, and there are times that I love it when God just says enough is enough and God gets the upper hand, and that's what happened here in this text. I think Luke had a great sense of humor because what he writes next is hilarious to me. He says in verse 14, seven sons of Sceva, the Jewish high priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Look what it says in verse 16. Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, prevailing against them, so they ran out of the house naked and wounded. Oh, what I wouldn't give to see a video of that, right? Well, that'd make a great uh, video for your presentation, Dan, for the next time to see something. I mean, God got the upper hand on that one, right? God said, enough is enough. We're done with this. And what was the result? Look what happened in verse 17. The result, when this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. Man, God used this. More people came to know Christ. The new life of the gospel began to course through the veins of more people. And as the new life of the gospel impacted people's hearts, they began to recognize sin in their lives. Verse 19, or 18, and many who had become believers came confessing and dis disclosing their practices. So there were believers that were still practicing some kind of magic or some kind of spiritism. And then we have finally kind of the culmination of this section, a bonfire and a book burning. In my mind, I can always see this, probably got this image from watching uh, an Indiana Jones movie where the Nazis were burning books in a big pile. If I see someone at least shaking their head, yes, you remember that scene. I can just see in Ephesus, they're all taking these books, they're burning their, and these are believers it's talking about here in the text. It says in verse 19, while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone, and God was working in these people. They realized these sinful practices, they realized that they were bringing in satanic worship into their home, and they burned these books and it said they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver, which, my friends, if you were to calculate that up, was 135 years of salary for the average person. This is an outrageous amount of money. This is an outrageous number of books. This is an incredible number of people who were believing and responding to the gospel. Friends, never underestimate the power of the gospel to change people's hearts. Never underestimate the power of the gospel to change your heart. And God will work when his people are pricked in their consciences about their sin. What would happen if God moved in our church, in your homes, to help push out the dead leaves of sin that are hanging on to your branches? How would God work? Look what happened in Ephesus. The word of God spread. Verse 20 is the summary of this section. In this way, the word of the Lord flourished and prevailed. God's word flourishes when his people get serious about sin. What kind of sin do you have in your life? What areas of sin do you need to get rid of in your heart? Where do you need the new life of the gospel to come through your branches and push the dead leaves of sin away? I want to wrap this section up with just a couple of application points. It's amazing to see what God can do through a hard-working servant. And here Paul was faithfully serving, working a job in the morning, in the evening, preaching in the afternoon. This was probably one of Paul's most fruitful ministries ever. Churches were planted. All those churches of Asia were planted. God saved many people. They pushed the darkness away. 
in the city of Ephesus. And man, God moved mightily through a man who is dedicated to working hard for the gospel. I want you to know, church, that your efforts to serve Christ are never useless. They always have value. Anytime you serve God, there's value to it. Anytime you serve God, God will use that. Never underestimate the contribution that you can make in serving God because He will use it sometimes beyond what you can even imagine, as was the case here in the text. This last week I was watching football with my son, something I always enjoy doing, and there was a game on with the New Orleans Saints, and this player on the Saints named Alvin Kamara. You know who that is? He's a great player. He got a ball. He ran. There were people hitting him, pulling at his leg, pushing him, and he just kept his balance. He didn't go out of bounds, and he moved, and he went around and scored a touchdown. It was an amazing run. I don't know how he stayed on his feet. And you think, man, he's, he's really talented, but then they showed a clip of his training regimen. And at this point, I rewound a little bit and said, hey, Liz, you got to see this. My wife doesn't actually enjoy football. I have been trying for years to suck her into football. And so she looks up, all right, what do you got to show me? And I'm very not impressed, and I push play again, and suddenly I look over. I'm like watching her, and I see her eyes go. She smiles. I'm like, yes, I'm getting her. I'm getting her. I'm getting her. Yeah. She's like, that was amazing. Yes, I got her. (laughs) Yeah, she's like, that was, I don't know how he stood up, how he stayed up. Then they showed his training regimen, and he's in a gym, and he's on an exercise ball, standing on one foot, getting passes to him and balls and trying to balance himself, and someone's hitting him, and he's exercising his muscles for the sake of balance, and all of that preparation pays off because in the game, it worked, and he scored a touchdown. All of your hard labors for the gospel, friends, it'll pay off. God will use it. Don't underestimate the way that you serve him. Secondly, I want you to see it's just amazing to see the Word of God flourish when believers are serious about sin. Maybe in your life you feel a bit stalled spiritually. Maybe in your life you feel like you just sort of kind of hit a ceiling. Well, maybe it's time this week to just evaluate your heart and your life, to evaluate the things that you watch, to evaluate the things that you take in, to evaluate all the areas of sin in your life and to get serious through the power of the gospel to get rid of those areas of sin that's keeping you back spiritually. Never underestimate the power of God when believers get serious about sin. Well, this is the first half of the story. The second half gets a little darker. God worked amazingly in the city of Ephesus. God pushed back the darkness in the city of Ephesus. The new life of Christ was pushing back the darkness. But, oh, friend, whenever the darkness is being pushed back, you can expect this, that the darkness is not going to go down without a fight. In the second half of, the, of chapter 19 in the story of Ephesus is the darkness roaring back because it's been pushed down. The darkness is not going to go down without a fight. And in the second half of chapter 19, what does it look like? It looks like a mob riot. Now, it's interesting as we go through the rest of chapter 19, we can see some similarities of what happens here to our culture today. You know, I don't know about you, but we've seen protests, we've seen marches through the years, and a lot of times peaceful protests, peaceful marches, but probably in maybe the first time in my life, in my generation, we're seeing the power, the destructive power of a mob riot, how people can get swept up in a moment and do things that they wouldn't normally do, burn businesses down, create havoc in cities. We're going to watch this exact thing happen here in the city of Ephesus. How does it start? Well, it starts with an instigator. Verse 23, about that time there was a major disturbance about the way For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, Men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You can see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. What's Demetrius saying? He's saying that this Christianity thing, this is going to affect our pocketbooks. 
This is going to affect our bottom line, our livelihoods. People aren't buying idols the way they used to. People aren't buying our carved images. Why? Because this Christianity says that these idols have no power. And he's gathering a group of people, gathering a tribe. Verse 27, not only do we run the risk that our businesses may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. What's he doing now? He's galvanizing them around a religious fervor. Not only is our pocketbooks being affected, but our God is being insulted. And it says the very one of all Asia that we come to worship. Verse 28, when they heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and he gives them a slogan to rally behind. So interesting to watch the dynamics of a mob riot. It's always been, this is 2,000 years ago, and it assembles the same way that it assembles in our world today. And this is Satan's tool for pushing back the light of the gospel that's been true here in Ephesus that Paul has brought through seeing people come to faith in Christ. They get behind some propaganda. They get behind a slogan. They begin to march. They begin to riot. And a mob fills up this this place it says the city, verse 29, the city was filled with confusion. They rushed to the amphitheater, which held 25,000 people. This was a large gathering, and they dragged along Gaius and Aristarchus. And so as what happens with mob riots, they began to get violent on innocent people. And here they just grab Gaius and they grab Aristarchus. And verse 30, look what happens. The Apostle Paul, this is crazy. Paul just had a different brain. His brain was different than mine. Right, as you read this, this is crazy. What does Paul do in verse 30? I want to go into the riot. I have never thought that in my life, ever. How about you? Anybody think that you see a riot going on? Like, what I wouldn't give to be in the middle of that. I've never thought that. What does Paul say in verse 30? I'm ready to go. Paul wanted to go in. Before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. They, they held him back. He wanted to go in. They held him back. And Luke, like the great author that he is, and I think verse 32 is just a bit comedic because it really describes the mob riot culture. Look what it says in verse 32. Some were shouting one thing. Some were shouting another because the assembly was in confusion. And here's, here's the line that I find so interesting. Most of them did not even know why they had come together. <laughs> Most of them had no clue why they were there. You read this, you're like, is, was, was this written last week or 2,000 years ago, right? It's Luke's describing what this looks like. Now, we introduce what we would refer to today as cancel culture. That's what happens next. Is, these are the dynamics of a mob riot. I was greatly helped in this sermon by an article that came out from the resource Desiring God. If you're interested in looking this up, I can send you that link, but it just helped to analyze this. Here's the appearance of cancel culture. What happens after verse 32? Verse 33 says this. Some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front. So Alexander's a Jewish person. The Jews wanted to make sure that the Ephesians knew that it wasn't them, that they're different than Paul, that they were on their side. So this Alexander is supposed to be coming out as a friend. He's there to say, hey, look, I'm a friend of you, Ephesians. Don't look at us. Don't get mad at us. I'm a friend. And what happens to Alexander? Because he's Jewish, they wouldn't even listen to what he had to say. So what is cancel culture? Cancel culture is the idea of a mob ruling with no sense of reasoning whatsoever. People just getting caught up in some kind of movement with no sense of reasoning. There's no way to reason through it. It's just go along with the mob. And that's what happens here. Alexander steps forward. He's supposed to be a friend. He's going to address the crowd, and he tries and it says, motioning with his hand, in verse 33, Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, they shouted in unison. Get this, now they shouted in unison for two hours. I can't even fathom this. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. For two hours, they yelled this chant in the amphitheater. Well, thank God for some righteous city leaders. This man steps up, verse 35, when the city clerk calmed the crowd down, he said, people of Ephesus, what person is here 
who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis in the image that fell from heaven. Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. Now, this guy is essentially the mayor of the city. For you have brought these men here who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with them have a case against anyone, let the courts decide. They are our pro counsels. Let them bring charges against one another. What, what does he say to them? You've got to do this the right way. You have to go through right channels. You need to go through the courts. There's a way to do this rightly. This is not the right way to do it. There is a right way to do it, and you need to do it the right way. Why? Because in verse 40, in fact, we run the risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today since there's no justification we can give a reason for the disturbance. The Roman Empire did not like riots, and they would clamp down on them. They would punish a city where there were riots. And so this mayor comes and says, you guys got to get your act together and do this the right way because we're going to be punished if you don't. Thank God for a reasonable city mayor who took control of the situation. Now let's go back for a moment and think about something that's very interesting. Why did this start to begin with? It started because the idol makers in the city of Ephesus were having their pocketbooks affected because of the impact of the gospel. Now, I just find that very interesting. What that teaches us today is that the gospel rightly applied in our hearts, the gospel taking root in the hearts of people, taking root in the hearts of Christians, the gospel should change your spending habits. If more people were coming to faith in Christ, if the gospel was taking root in more Christians' hearts, if more believers were tithing the way that the Bible teaches us to do, less money would be moving into different parts of the economy. It just makes me wonder, if the gospel is taking root in our culture like it was in Ephesus, what kinds of industries would be affected? And then how upset would our culture be at Christianity? I would say that there'd probably be a major dip in alcohol sales if the gospel really took root in people's hearts. There'd be a dip in the gambling industry. I would say if the gospel took widespread root in people's hearts that there would be police forces laying off policemen because crime rates would drop. Wouldn't that be interesting? The gospel can have an impact, and here we have in the city of Ephesus, the gospel was actually having an impact in the city because it was changing people's spending habits. Friends, that's encouraging to me. And the reason why it's encouraging is because we have the most powerful message on earth. And it's the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead. And it's that message that can change people's lives. And it changed so many people's lives in Ephesus that it actually impacted the local economy for good. Now, Satan wasn't going to have any of that. He roared back. He wanted to try to squelch that. Thank God for a city mayor that got control of the situation. And it looks like, at least here, they were out of it without a problem. I want to think about some of these things here this morning. Help us apply the text. It's so interesting, the dynamics of how this works. Let's make some applications this morning. Number one, I want you to know this. That there's going to be resistance when God is working. There's going to be resistance when God is working. Let's just be honest with one another. We're living in somewhat of a scary time in our world, aren't we? We're living in, boy, I hate to use the word because you're just sick of hearing this, unprecedented times. Have you heard that word in 2020? Anybody? It's probably going to be the word of the year for 2020. Unprecedented times. I'm not sure that it's all that unprecedented. As I read Acts chapter 19, I'm like, this, this looks like our world here today. We are living in scary times, but friends, one of the things that living in scary times helps me to understand is it helps me to understand that while there's some scary things happening, that God is still working. And in fact, because God is working, there's resistance. I guess I would be more afraid if there wasn't resistance. Because what you see in the Scriptures is that when God is working, it's met with resistance. This is culturally true, but it's also true in your own lives as well. I'm always very concerned for people who are new believers who come to faith in Christ, and I, I like to warn new believers to make sure not to get lazy or, or, or to be sure that they understand that they may face opposition in their life. I've seen that happen so many times with new believers. They come to faith in Christ, and suddenly 
bam, they just get blindsided by an attack from Satan. It does happen. Maybe you've decided this year to send your kids to Christian school or public school. Let me help you understand that you will face opposition. They will face opposition, possibly even from teachers and have their faith challenged and tested. Maybe you decided to homeschool your kids this year. Let me help you understand, families, that if you made that choice, your kids will act like rabid wolves ready to devour you. And you need to be ready to tame those demons, all right? It's going to happen. You're going to face resistance no matter what. Maybe you've sat here in this church before and you've thought to yourself, man, you know, we've tried small group. We've been in different small It just doesn't work really well. It's been awkward. I just can't get... Uh, maybe small group's not for us. Let me ask you this question. Do you think it's God telling you that or do you think that's coming from a different source? Does God want you to be with other believers and have other believers impacting your life? Does He want gospel growth in your life? The answer is yes. Try it again. Number two, know when to engage the crowd for the good of the gospel. Yeah, this is tricky. Paul is a little nuts. We all know that. Acts 19, verse 30. There's a riot. Paul wants to run in the middle of it. Now, he had some friends that held him back. Know when to engage the crowd. There are times to speak up and share the truth. I would say that time is probably not to run down into the middle of a tense situation and stand on this street corner and preach the gospel. I would say the time to speak up and the way to speak up is in small contexts where you can influence people with the truth of the gospel. To take people that you know, people that God's placed in your life, to be a beacon of light and truth in a dark time, and to influence people for the sake of the gospel. The third one goes right along with that, and that's this. Know when to stay out of the fray for the good of the gospel as well. There are times to hold back. Thankfully, Paul had some good friends that said, I don't think you want to do that. Let's hold you back, bud. I don't think we want you in the middle of that riot. But we all need that. We all need those moments where we stay out of the fray. We all need those friends that say to us, maybe you shouldn't have posted that on social media. We all need that because there's always those times where you're just so tempted. Ah, oh, I just, you know, if I just landed this zinger, I bet you it would change the world. It's not going to. It's going to make it worse, okay? Know when to stay out of the fray for the good of the gospel. Listen, the gospel is powerful, properly applied. We see it in the lives of people here in Ephesus, and we see the gospel impacting the broader culture in Ephesus. The gospel is powerful. Keep being faithful to preach the gospel in the context that God has given you to push the new life of the gospel through dead branches, to push off dead leaves in people's lives, starting right here with your very own life. Let's bow for